This video is sponsored by Brilliant. A simple pendulum. A planet orbiting a star. Two balls colliding. If you've studied physics at school, chances are you're familiar with these kinds of systems. You describe the position of each element in the system with a number, or several numbers, and the change in those numbers is their velocity. This works very well for these kinds of systems, but there's a whole world of things you can't describe this way. Because how do you apply this kind of maths to, say, flowing water? What about fluids? Scientists including Archimedes, Da Vinci, and Newton, as well as presumably some people who weren't white dudes but the history books never mention, studied the physics of fluids. But it wasn't until 1739, at the publication of Hydrodynamica by Daniel Bernoulli, that we started using mathematics to describe fluids. Since 1739, their physics have become better and better understood, with key contributions coming from Claude Louis Navier and George Gabriel Stokes, whose work together produced this beautiful equation describing how any fluid flows. You learn to love it. And one of the reasons you learn to love it is because this amazing equation has applications that go from a droplet of water to our entire galaxy. I was introduced to the physics of fluid mechanics during my time studying at Oxford. Specifically, I fell in love with the maths of fluids in the library at St Peter's College over a decade ago. But there was another location super significant in my personal learning journey. And that is right here, I think actually under this exact tree, in Christchurch Meadows in Oxford. It was here in 2011 that I sat and compiled some very early notes on what fluid mechanics was, based on the lecture notes I had to date and a textbook. I sat here by the river discovering a whole new way I could use mathematics to describe the world, to describe this very river, in fact. And in retrospect, it was one of those moments that completely changed the course of the rest of my life. And the concept that did it was fluid elements. You've almost certainly heard that we can divide matter into solids, liquids, and gases. Yes, there are more states of matter, but that's a video for another time. Most of the time, you will be dealing with solid matter or fluid matter. On a molecular level, a solid is a substance in which molecules, or atoms, are tightly packed and, crucially, interact with one another strongly. This is typically through electromagnetic forces between electrons in neighbouring molecules, or atoms. These forces keep the structure of a solid quite rigid. By contrast, a fluid can have molecules quite close to one another, but they don't interact strongly. In water, for example, electrons in neighbouring molecules don't directly interact, but their charge within a single water molecule is unevenly distributed. More positive on one side of the molecule, more negative on the other. These charged dipoles in each molecule exert a weaker electromagnetic force on each other. These weaker forces between molecules in fluids means that they can move around more freely, and so a gas or a liquid will deform easily when an external force is applied, in contrast to a solid, which won't. Now you might think to yourself, fine, why is this interesting? you big nerd. Because while this may sound niche, systems of large numbers of weakly interacting objects are everywhere, from inside my body to the planet that I'm living on, and beyond. But in order to understand those things, we need a special piece of maths. And this is where a fluid element comes in. It's, if you like, a small parcel of a fluid. Imagine keeping track of this square of molecules. As time marches on, the fluid in that square is deformed by the flow, and it changes shape and size. All the molecules originally in the square are still there, they're just spread out in a different shape. The important thing is that a fluid element has enough molecules in it to be in the continuum limit. What that means is that instead of considering a bunch of individual molecules, we can average what they're doing in a meaningful way. For example, every molecule has a certain kinetic energy. We say that the temperature of an object is the average kinetic energy of a molecule in that object. But that average doesn't mean much if there are, say, three molecules. We need more like thousands or millions for the average to be meaningful. Mathematically, we require that n l cubed is much greater than 1, where n is the number density, in other words, how many objects there are per unit volume on average, and l is the rough scale of the system we're considering. Basically, are we looking at millimetres or 
kilometers. There's a balancing act here. We require that our fluid element is large enough that it contains enough molecules to have averages that are physically meaningful, but also small enough that there are no significant variations in it of a variable of interest, like say, temperature. When you can satisfy both of these properties, you can do some really interesting maths. For example, you can isolate a section of fluid and consider the forces acting on it, which we can assume to have single values. A section of fluid with density ρ acted on by net force F will experience an acceleration as per Newton's second law. However, this gives us an acceleration relative to that fluid element, which may itself also be moving and deforming. We refer to this rate of change as something in or of a fluid element as the material or Lagrangian derivative. And sometimes we are interested in that derivative, but more often than not, we're interested in what's going on in a fixed coordinate system, like what's happening relative to a box that the fluid is in, what we call the Eulerian derivative. Fortunately, these two derivatives can be related really quite easily. The material derivative is the Eulerian derivative, but with some extra accounting on the end, just to do with how the fluid element is moving around. Don't worry about it. Applying that to Newton's second law acting on a fluid element gives us an equation that describes how fluid moves in a box, or anywhere else you'd like to put a fluid. You can see that this is basically where the Navier-Stokes equation comes from, but with a few extra bits. Don't worry about it. One of the obvious ways we can apply these ideas is to water. We can, for example, look for the steady state solution, meaning it doesn't change over time, for water flowing down a cylindrical pipe. The equation for acceleration in the reference frame of the pipe, given a pressure P forcing water down the pipe, looks like this. We can solve it by assuming that the water molecules at the very edges must be stationary, what we call the no-slip condition, and voila, you recover the speed of the water at different distances away from the pipe wall. But that's a super simple example. You can also use these equations to describe how water flows around the world's oceans, and how it transports heat and salt. During my degrees, I learned about the many applications of these equations to fluids on Earth. Perhaps most obviously, you can describe the atmosphere using these equations, calculating how it will flow in response to energy coming in from the sun. This is how weather forecasts are made. But you don't need to stop there. The same equations can be applied to atmospheres on other planets. For example, explaining Jupiter's bands of clouds, or Saturn's hexagonal polar vortex. Or I learned you could go deeper and model the movement of the Earth's molten interior using the exact same equations. But here's the thing about learning journeys. They don't end. Since my degree, I've learned so much more about physics and about how universal some of the concepts are. When I was last here, I experienced a conceptual revolution about how you can use mathematics to describe the world around us, to describe water and the atmosphere. But that's not all you can do with that maths. Since then, I've learned that you can apply those same ideas, that same fluid maths, to stars. And I don't just mean describing the internal dynamics of stars. Yes, you can use fluid maths for that, sure. But you can also use the same ideas to describe how stars move within a galaxy. Instead of considering molecules making up a droplet of water, we can consider stars making up a galaxy. Because both are formed of large numbers of individual components that are tiny compared to the whole, and that weakly interact with one another, electromagnetically in one case and gravitationally in the other. Mathematically, they're very similar. But, you may say, water molecules are way more tightly packed than stars are in a galaxy. And you'd be right. The average separation of water molecules is about a nanometer, which isn't much bigger than the size of a water molecule. And while stars can be millions of kilometers across, they are on average millions of millions of kilometers apart. However, let's go back to our definition of a fluid element. We require that the number of objects in our element is much greater than one. And if we select, say, one millionth of the volume of our galaxy, on average, there will be more than 100,000 stars in that volume, more than enough to satisfy the averaging requirements for fluid mechanics. The difference between a galaxy and, say, water is instead that the constituent objects of a galaxy don't frequently collide with each other. Thank God while water molecules do. So we draw a distinction between collision null and collision less 
fluids. In a collisional fluid, we can define a pressure due to the constant collisions of neighbouring objects like molecules in water. And we can relate that pressure to the density of the system by what we call an equation of state. In a collisionless fluid, you can't do either of those things. So instead of considering a pressure being the force acting on a fluid element in a galaxy, we instead consider how gravity, created by stars, changes throughout a galaxy. Apart from that though, the mathematical ideas are basically the same. We treat the galaxy as being a smoothly varying continuum and can follow the trajectory of an individual fluid element, or even an individual star, or the evolution of the whole system over time. And we observe behaviours that we typically associate with fluid flows on Earth, such as chaos. The evolution of a single star through a galaxy, especially in configurations like a spiral arm, can be turbulent and chaotic. No, not that kind of galactic chaos. One particularly cool thing this allows you to do is measure where stars are and how fast they're moving today, and then apply our fluid equations to that system. But instead of going forwards in time, turn the clock back. We can guess what the galaxy looked like a hundred years ago. And then, using that as a starting point, we could apply our equations again, and guess what the galaxy looked like 200 years ago. Keep going backwards, and you can perform galactic archaeology, reconstructing the deep past of the galaxy. Spoiler alert, using this technique, we know that at some point in the distant past, the Milky Way collided with another galaxy. And for more about that, you can watch the video I made with a student at the University of Cambridge studying his PhD in galactic archaeology. Another very cool application of this technique is in dark matter research, because it turns out that the gravity created by stars isn't enough to explain how galaxies behave. You need to add the gravity from some stuff that we can't see, dark matter. How much of it, and where it is, are questions that can be interrogated by modelling the galaxy, and the dark matter, as a fluid. But why stop at a galaxy? This is where things get really mind-blowing. Because galaxies themselves are formed into clusters, and superclusters, each containing tens or hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And the way that those galaxies formed into clusters is studied using fluid mechanics. It's another system that satisfies our requirements for a fluid element. Just this time the constituent objects themselves, galaxies, are also modelled as fluid systems. From galaxy clusters to galaxies to stars themselves, it's fluids all the way down. We're actually weird because we can't be described as a fluid. Although quite a lot of us can be. What I'm getting at in this video is that the ideas of fluids, the mathematics of fluids, are universal. They apply at the tiniest, humblest scales, and also on the scale of the observable universe. So I suppose that means that what I'm really getting at is that physics is awesome. <laughs> to me, physics is beautiful. Physics strips away the surface details and renders the world in abstract relationships. And the more you look, the more you find the same relationships everywhere. This river that I sat next to all those years ago and made my notes on fluid mechanics is governed by those equations. The same equations that govern how our star moves around our galaxy, and how our galaxy moves around the universe. And if you don't think that's cool, don't worry about it. When was the last time you thought about Newton's second law? You might still be in school and so it might have been yesterday, or it could have been years, or even decades. As I said earlier, learning journeys are lifelong, but they don't have to be formal, and they certainly don't have to be expensive or boring. If you would like to learn about topics in physics, chemistry, maths or computer science, whether you're at school or haven't thought about Newton's laws in 20 years, Brilliant is a free and easy way to do so, and they've kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, covering the basics right the way up to advanced topics, and they're adding new lessons every single month. As you've already seen, these lessons are beautifully illustrated, and crucially, they're interactive. The whole point of Brilliant is to get you actively involved in your learning, and that means you choosing the topics that you are interested in studying, but also getting you to apply your knowledge as soon as you learn it. And if you get something wrong, as Brilliant stresses, that's a healthy part of a learning process. And wouldn't you know it, they have lessons on Newton's laws as part of their course on classical mechanics. In bite-sized chunks of 15 minutes a day, you can support your learning in the classroom or be introduced to cool new concepts like relativity. To get started learning about the world around you, 
free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for continuing to be, well, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Huge thanks must go to my Patreon supporters. These are the names of my lovely executive producer patrons. My executive producers and my producers picked this video topic for this month. And I just want to say thank you because I had a blast making this video. This is the kind of thing that I wish I could do more of. So yeah, thank you for letting me do this. <laughs> if you would like to support my work and get access to exclusive content and have a say in what videos get made, then you can check out a link to my Patreon in the description. What do you think is the coolest application of fluid mechanics? I can guarantee that there are tons of systems that I've never heard of. So please let me know about your cool application of this maths down there in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a thumbs up and do share it with people that you think may find it interesting. If you'd like to watch something else, then here's some of my previous videos. And that just leads me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.